Now the very first time DJI showed me this Ronin 4D, I was completely caught off guard. It was not something I was expecting DJI to put out, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized it actually kind of makes perfect sense. Out front, we have this full frame sensor, which is stabilized with this three axis gimbal. And we can also activate a fourth axis with this arm, which is partially mechanical, partially electronic. This is gonna help reduce that Z axis motion. You know, if you're walking, step in, or you're sitting on a washing machine, something like that. And also, you'll notice that there are sensors along the front right here, and also down here on the bottom. And these are the type of sensors that you can see on DJI's drones, and that's also gonna give it a little bit more feedback on its height and its positioning to further give you better stabilization. Pretty impressive, right? Game changing. I know you guys hate it when I say that word, but I mean, now this one is the X9 6K, but there's also gonna be an X9 8K if you're looking for that extra resolution. But I like the bigger pixels and 6K is plenty of resolution for me. And this also has a dual native ISO at 800 and 5000, which you can switch to in lower lit environments. And interestingly enough, this whole thing can be detached. So I'm very curious to see what DJI is gonna do with this ecosystem. Are we gonna have different types of heads that we can attach onto here? Are we gonna attach this camera onto different things like drones, we'll see. You can record in HD64 or ProRes 422HQ or ProRes RAW and we have your selection of color profiles from Rec 709 to HLG to D-Log or your own custom look. Now it looks like our background's a bit blown out but since we're getting over 14 stops of dynamic range on the 6K sensor, let's see if we can do some color grading magic and recover some of that. Now when it comes to a camera like this, the most important factor is image quality, right? So I'm gonna be doing a follow-up video where I show more of the footage that I was able to get out of this camera. But I'll give you a little teaser. I thought the footage looked really good in my opinion. And especially that ProRes RAW gives you tons of flexibility. So if you're trying to match other cameras, I don't think you're gonna have too many issues. But in this video, I'm gonna be focused more on the huge list of features that we are getting on this camera. One of the things I thought was really cool is if you're in a place like this and you don't have a fluid head tripod, you could always just set this camera down and use the joystick to try to get that nice smooth shot. And look at that shot of Dylan sitting on a rock thinking he's cool. Now the sensitivity and responsiveness of the joystick is fully customizable. So that took me a little bit to dial into my preferences, but now I'm feeling pretty good with it. Now me personally, the thing I find most impressive about this Ronin 4D is the amount of features they were able to pack into this thing. And not only that, but just make it very easy to access, even if you're out hiking in the middle of nowhere or you're a solo operator. And speaking of convenience, when I first saw this, I was like, ah, there's no way they could fit ND filters in here, right? But check it out. We have ND filters from one stop, two stop, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way up to nine every stop in between, which is pretty awesome. Now I kind of want to get some slow-mo shots, so let's look at our frame rate options. And this is a pretty big chart, so I'm gonna go ahead and throw it on the screen. And with the 8K version, it looks like you could get that 8K raw at 60 frames per second, but the asterisk on the 72 and 75 frames per second, that basically means it has to crop into an aspect ratio of 239 by one. Now looking at the 6K version, we can do 6K full frame at 48 frames per second. We can get 6K 60, but that is also gonna require that 239 by one aspect ratios. But if we crop into that super 35 mode, it looks like we could get 96 frames per second or 120 with that wider aspect ratio. But let's say I really wanna shoot 120 frames per second and I wanna use the full sensor, then I'm gonna to have to drop down to 2K ProRes 42 HQ. And it also looks like there's a few limitations depending on what kind of media you're gonna be recording onto. Now this is the Pro SSD, and this little thing here is actually an entire terabyte, which is pretty impressive but this is gonna give you no limitations, but you can actually remove this module and use a CFast Express Type B, which is gonna give you a majority of your options still. And there's also this USB-C port right here where you can plug in an external SSD and record straight onto that, which is gonna be the most budget-friendly option, but it's also gonna have the most limitations due to limited write speed. Now, I think one of the big X factors is what kind of lenses can you attach onto here because the space up here and this gimbal is fairly limited. So right now, this is a DL mount 
mount. And this attaches and detaches kind of like an EF mount. And these are the lenses I've been using so far, but the selection is pretty limited. I mean, there's a 24, 35, and 50. There's also a 16 mil prime, but that is not a full frame lens. Now I did ask DJI if they were planning on expanding on this lens lineup, but they haven't been able to tell me much. So we'll have to wait and see for that. But to switch out the mount is actually really easy. You don't have to use any screws or anything like that. There's a locking ring right here and the whole mount actually just came off. And this is a E mount and there's also a M mount that I've seen so far. And an M mount actually does sound pretty interesting because if you're looking into some pretty compact lenses, there seems to be some good options there. Now this is Sony 16 to 35 F4 and it's a fairly compact lens and I can go ahead and slide that LiDAR back on and to balance it we get to skip a few steps because it's pretty symmetrical so I'm gonna go ahead and start with the tilt and we're gonna slide this all the way back and this just tells me that this is pretty much as big of a lens I can throw on it it is a little bit top heavy because I have this LiDAR in here and usually if you put a focus system down here it will help balance out the top heaviness but the motors can compensate for this so if I tilt the camera to the left I can see that it's front heavy so let's go ahead slide that back a little bit and I think right around there so now I'm gonna go ahead and get this fired up and I was actually surprised that I'm able to control the lens already electronically it doesn't require the focus gears and motor if you're trying to run some manual lenses you just mount this down here and plug it in so it's pretty straightforward now let's go ahead and try to balance the fourth axis and it tells me I just have to turn this top knob counterclockwise and once I get it centered I should be all balanced and and this will also tell me if I need to adjust my tilt or pan as well. It's a pretty straightforward process balancing this, so I like that. And now we are officially switched over to the Sony E-mount. Now DJI just gave me this list of lenses that are compatible, and I'm sure they're gonna add to it as they test out more lenses, but it's interesting to see that there are some lenses that you should use a counterbalance with, so I'm curious to see how that all works in. But what's cool about this LiDAR system is you can kind of turn any lens into an autofocus system, and programming it in is pretty straightforward. Now one thing I would love to see is some sort of rig or brace that will hold this nice and securely on there in case you want to attach a big old lens on here and that probably means you can't use it in gimbal mode but if you're an owner operator not every single project you're ever going to shoot is going to be shot from a gimbal so maybe if you want to throw an ingenue zoom lens on here that would be an option if there was a nice way to support it and that would be also a good way to use it in handheld mode now yeah you can go ahead and turn off all the stabilization and lock everything in place to get more of that handheld type of feel but i don't know how much i trust putting a ton of weight on this gimbal and there is also a little bit of play even when things are locked in now most tripod plates also seem to cover the bottom sensors but the zx seems to still be pretty stable even with that sensor covered so i don't think it's a big deal but maybe someone can design a plate that will leave an opening for those sensors or maybe like a vct style plate where you know part of the mounting happens up front and part of it happens in the back and you can just drop it in now let me go ahead and show you super cool feature number 38 these handles come off and then i could go ahead attach that onto this external monitor and i have full camera control so let's pan it over to us hello over there I told you there's a lot of cool features in here. You know, you show up, you have a long day of shooting out in the sun and you're secretly hung over, you know, you just set the camera up on a tripod, go back to your car and just operate this thing remotely. And it's a pretty serious monitor too, 1500 nits, so you can brighten this thing up and up to 20,000 feet of transmission. Now, of course, that's gonna be completely unobstructed, but still, that's like over three and a half miles. Love that this is integrated into the whole system. Now, I definitely wanna get myself a Force Pro. That's the thing that makes it so you can literally move around and the camera gimbal will match that motion. They made it for the Ronin 2, but it also works on here. And also if you're super fancy, you could get the master wheels for the Ronin 2, which is also compatible with this. So many ways to control this thing. Now my biggest question is how much is this thing going to cost? Now, as of right now, I have no idea, but they have told me that they're gonna try to make it competitive. All right, so now that we're filming at night, let's try to take advantage of this dual native ISO. So right now we're at ISO 800 or exposure index, but you can kind of think of them as the same thing. Let's bring it up to 2000, not enough. Let's pop it up to 5000 where that higher ISO base starts. Now, personally, I'm a huge fan of a nice clean user interface. Last thing I want to be doing on set is digging through the menu, trying to figure out how to do something. And I think this is as clean and simple as it gets. For example, if you want to change the ND filter right here, I can press the touchscreen and scroll through it that way. Or if you're not a fan of touchscreen, you could always press the corresponding button. So notice that 
that there's eight buttons, four on the top, four on the bottom. And then let's say I wanna adjust the aperture. I can go ahead and just hit that, but then I could also set it to auto and that will just allow me to set the exposure value. But let's go ahead and go back to manual and leave it at F2.8. And then we have the shutter speed. Now I'm personally not a huge fan of shutter speed. I prefer shutter angle if I'm filming video. So you can long press it and you can change that shutter unit over to angle mode. And now I can dial this into 180 degrees and I'm gonna leave it right there. So when I change my frame rates, my shutter speed is gonna change accordingly. And if we go into the menu here, we have our image area. So we're on full frame, but if you have some super 35 lenses, we can hop into super 35 mode. And of course there's certain frame rates that are only accessible at super 35 mode. So you may need to toggle that for some technical reasons. And we have ProRes 422, RAW, or H.264. And then recording light, I have it on D-Log, which is generally what I prefer. And then let's go into audio and you can see that there is an internal microphone built into here, which is great for reference. And you can always attach a separate type of microphone and fix that in right there. So love that. And then we have our display here. I have my false color set. So every time I hit my exposure button, it will activate the false color. But if you prefer waveform, let's do that. And every time I hit the exposure now, it just pops up that waveform. So I love that it's given us all the tools that I want. But this right here, LiDAR waveform, one of the coolest things I've seen in a really long time. So here on the right, you can see where I'm focused. So I can pull it all the way to infinity. So I'm focused on the background. And then I can also pull it close to me. But Dylan is right there in the middle. And go ahead and move left to right, Dylan. And you can actually see right now, Dylan's at the left of frame. So that's there. And this is the right of frame. So you can generally get an idea of where he is in focus. Now don't take a few steps back and you'll see that the focus moves back here. So if I wanna track him, I can just follow my wheel over to him. And then Dylan, go ahead and take a few steps closer to me and see how he moves up. If I wanna chase him, I just bring that yellow one right up to here. And this is such a nice focus assist tool. And now that I have it on autofocus, you can literally see the focus chasing Dylan's LiDAR. And since all the focus data is coming out of this LiDAR, you can be focusing in really dimly lit environments. And if you look right here, I can also hit track. So this is gonna activate the active track. So not only is it focusing on Dylan, but it's also following him. Now get out of my way, Dylan. Here, I'm gonna go ahead and highlight myself now. And now I can just vlog like this. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another video from the best channel on planet Earth, Potato Gin. I'm just gonna walk over here and guess what? I'm still in frame and I'm in focus. This LiDAR goes out to 10 meters. And let's say I'm not a huge fan of this composition. I wanna go more this way. Then I can shift that over and it will hold my position and generally this way. Now it's not hard to lose this active track. If I move fast, then I can. And also I noticed that it's pretty good at sticking to my face even if I turn around and it'll hold the back of my head. Now I'm actually curious what a higher ISO is. Let's try 12,800 and let's see how this looks. How much noise are we seeing at 12,800? And wow. I don't know what I'm doing, guys. All right, now let's take a close-up look at the camera, starting here at the 5.5-inch display, which is huge compared to a lot of other monitors. I love it. It's nice and sharp. It's bright at 1,000 nits, so you can see it outside. One of the best onboard monitors I've seen on a camera. You like what I'm doing here, by the way, with the reflection? I'm so clever sometimes. Oh, my gosh. Wow, potato jet. You should run for president. I would vote for myself so fat. Can you vote for yourself? You run for president. Right now I have it mounted to the top handle with this cold shoe and it's got some good swivel action going on. And also three buttons back here, one for peaking, one for the LUT and one for exposure. So I have this set to false color. Then going around to the side here, we have our menu, a scroll wheel, which we can click in. And we also have playback. Now, what I like about this playback is when you press it, it automatically just starts playing the most recent clip, which is what I'm trying to do most of the time anyways. And then we also have buttons lined up on the top and bottom, which will help us navigate the menu. And coming up front, we have the LiDAR, which can be removed very easily if needed. And it's attached with a USB type C cable right here, but there's also a second slot right here if you want to plug in the follow focus, which would plug in just right there. But this is DJI's lens, so it's all done electronically internally. And right now the gimbal's turned off and it's locked into place. And you can tell because of these little red indicators, but as I switch them to release the axis, I can go ahead 
it, loosen everything up. And now I'm gonna go ahead and activate the gimbal. And to turn the gimbal on and off is this switch right here. So I'll turn it back off. I'll put it back in follow. And here you can adjust the follow mode. So pan follow, or pan tilt or FPV mode right here. And if you just wanna completely lock off the direction, you just put it in lock mode. And then of course we have the power button and then a lock switch, which locks all the buttons as well as the touch screen. This button, I'm not quite sure what it does, but I don't think it's important, but this is what you need to know. This is how you activate the fourth dimension or the Z axis. And then tucked down here is how you recenter the gimbal and also the Z mode, which gets toggled between lock if you want it to have the same height consistently or follow, which will adapt to your height smoothly, like if you're on a staircase. And then of course we want our most commonly used features right here on the hand grips where our hands are naturally gonna rest and we can also lock it if we don't wanna accidentally bump it. And if we double tap, we recenter the frame and we can also press and hold to lock the direction of the gimbal. I gotta say, I love this lever right here, which is a quick way to adjust the angle of the handle and it locks into place. And we also have a button to check our exposure. And this is to select the target for active track or autofocus. There's also another lever down here, which you can release. And this is another safety release right here, which will completely take off the handle. And then on the inside here, there's another button where you can press and hold to quickly activate sport mode. And then let's flip over to the right handle. Same type of deal with the lever to position the handle. We have a record button right where your thumb would rest. Now up top, instead of having the joystick, I have this focus wheel. And this is really cool because I have it on autofocus right now. So if I put my hand out front, you could actually see this dial turning, right? But if it focuses on the wrong thing, I could actually stop it and force it and shift it into a different position if needed. And then once you let go, it goes back into autofocus. So really cool stuff. And then here we also have focus peaking. Now I did once mess up and try to activate the peaking and accidentally cut a shot mid take during a job. So that was embarrassing. I had to go, oh, sorry, everybody. Can we um, reset? I cut the camera and get the slate back in there. And <laughs> Just don't be an idiot like me and try not to mix these up. And the mode button, this will toggle you between your ND filters, your ISO or your aperture, and you can use the wheel to adjust those settings. And one of the little things that's kind of cool when you're switching the ND filters with this wheel is you can actually feel it click into place as you're switching the filters. So this can be something that's smooth or it moves on its own or has a little tactile clicking feeling to it. So pretty cool stuff. And on this side, if we double press the trigger, it will activate the Z axis. And this side also can be removed the same way the other side can. And this button right here will be to toggle the autofocus on and off. So I think they did a really good job placing all the most important buttons right here on the grip. So we don't really have to let go of it so much. On the right side of the body is pretty straightforward. You have the port where you attach the display. You have the mic and headphone jack 3.5 bell and HDMI, which is a full size and DC in for power. And then this right here with the antennas is the wireless video transmitter. So this will allow me to see the video feed on that wireless monitor. And I love how clean it is and how it's just integrated and sandwiched in between the battery and the body. It doesn't really get in the way with cables and all these things dangling off the camera. So I love that. And DJI also told us there's gonna be another optional module, which will give us XLR inputs and SDI outputs. So that may be interesting for some of us. And all of this is gonna be powered off of one TB50 battery. You may have some of these laying around, like if you have a Ronin 2, that uh, just slides in like that. Now this charging hub is pretty cool. It just opens up like that and you drop in a battery to charge. It also has three other slots so you can have four charging. And also what's cool is that these charge way faster than they drain. As long as you've got one on the charger and one on the camera, you could just flip flop them and you could literally leave your camera on as long as you need to. Now the same also goes for the batteries for the external wireless monitor. And between this and the TB50, you can pretty much power all the things that we've talked about. And this all gets charged off one outlet. Now DJI did let me take this pre-production camera out to one of my jobs, which was really nice because usually prepping and packing for one of those shoots can be such a nightmare. I mean, you got your big old gimbal with its own battery and its own charger and a camera with its own battery and its charger and memory cards. And then you got your focus unit, which has its own batteries and the monitor that needs its own battery. And then a D tap to power the transmitter and the receiver. And it's just, you forget one thing and you're totally screwed. But this was just grabbing the camera, wireless monitor if you need it, and the chargers. And that's pretty much it. You know, I used to do a lot of these jobs where I had to do a lot of traveling for, and they required a camera with a lot of resolution, a good codec, good colors. That was stabilized on a gimbal. And if this was around back then, I would have totally used it because we had to lug around so much gear. And every time we had to move to the next city, we had to pack everything up and travel with it and unpack and reset everything 
up, this would have definitely made my life a whole lot easier. Now, of course, any professional camera needs to be able to record for hours straight without overheating. And yes, I did do my incubator test at 103 degrees Fahrenheit. It did totally fine. Now, I got to hand it to DJI. For their first pro camera of this type, they're really coming out of the gate hot. And they're really not holding much back. But anyways, let me know if you have any questions about this Ronin 4D down there in the comments. And I'll try to respond to a bunch of them in the follow-up video. But for now, I'm going to try to go get in the shade because I am definitely getting some sunburnt. I should have worn sunscreen which is yeah i have like such the worst tan look at the, oh my god 